All right. Well, I appreciate everybody hanging in there so long. We are uh, a half an hour away from the end. I'm going to um, use this time to, uh, first of all, to do thank yous, which often happen in the end. But in this case, I think thank yous are important to do at this point. Uh, the first person I have to thank is David Luberoff, who's right there. David, stand up. Um, there's, the way things work in this world is that um, part of the reason we're here is that Moise and Mustafavi, our dean, said to me in the fall, uh, I want you to do something to start changing the conversation or fostering a conversation at the school around affordable housing. And so I, I started thinking about what we could do to engage with the, with the design professions, the construction professions, came up with a gist of an idea, and I said to David, we should do this. In fact, you should do this. Um, and so a lot of the, what's, what's, what's here today, the speakers we have are really due to David's hard work, and I just really want to thank David for all he did to make today happen. Um, Kerry Donahue, who's our Director of Communications, who really technically and logistically makes everything happen. She's up in the booth behind the glass up there. So Kerry, thank you for all you do. J James Chackness, uh, who also makes all the trains run on time. In fact, James is probably somewhere making the trains run on time. He's probably outside. But James Chackness, wherever you are, are you here? No, he's not, but James, thank you. And lastly, um, a lot of other Joint Center staff, hold up your hands. Uh, the people have been running mics, passing things out. Um, this really is a big team effort. Uh, the other announcement I want to make is that um, there's a reward for having stayed this long, which is at the end of this, there's going to be a reception um, in the porticos, which are the far end of the building, where we're going to feature student work. The other thing we're trying to do today is to use this as a way to connect you all with the students here who are doing a lot of really innovative, creative work around affordable housing, broadly writ. So please go down there. There's beverages, there's food, and more importantly, um, there's some really uh, terrific student work for you and students for you to engage with. Um, and so with that, let me, uh, our last panel um, is uh, kind of a sequence of, of, of presentations as well as a panel. I want to start with um, Soraya Segu, who is a, a Loeb Fellow this year. She uh, came here this year after having uh, found, helped found the Urban Development Department at Mexico's Infonavit, which is uh, a very significant housing finance uh, institution in Mexico. And the issue that um, I'm going to have Soraya, I asked Soraya to speak to, and she has some slides, so she'll come up and give a brief presentation is that you know, today we're focused very, uh, very clearly on the question of how do we make housing more affordable. And a lot of times when you focus very intently on solving one problem, you ignore other things and create other problems, the law of unintended consequences. Some of the conversation today, I think, has really surfaced some of those issues. I think some of the aspects of labor and how is it that you, if you solve housing affordability by, by squeezing labor out of the equation, then we're going we're gonna to worsen that other part of the equation, which is incomes and how incomes have stagnated. And the other piece of this is that if you solve the affordability process by, by divorcing housing from the social aspect, we're going to create problems. And I think this is very much what we saw in Mexico. So, so today, I'd like to have you come up and talk to us a bit about both what happened in Mexico and what the lessons might be for those of us here who are working to solve this problem. So, Sereya. Hello, thank you for being still being here since this is a long uh, afternoon and thank you, Chris, and thank you, David. Um, I, I, I have only a few minutes to try to, in a reductionist way, try to explain what is the condition of the housing or how was the condition of the housing in Mexico uh, in the first decade of this century, and then what we try to do and what, what are the, the lessons that we um, learn in the process. Um, how should I? Uh, just a little background, uh, because we have a different context from what we've been talking about in the last panel, but just to give some numbers of the extension of, of uh, the condition of the problem there. 70% uh, of the total population live in urban areas, so it's a very urban uh, condition in Mexico. And 60% of the housing in Mexico is informal. So from, from the other 30%, Infonavit finance 70% uh, of that. So one 
on each four houses in, in Mexico is financed by Infonavit. Uh, it's a very solid uh, mortgage institution. It's the third largest in the, in the world in, in terms of uh, the origination of credits. And what happened, as Chris was saying, like what happened when we focused on producing, which was the, the policy uh, of the beginning of the century of focusing on uh, how can we produce more housing and reduce the, the, the amount of housing that is needed. And in Mexico, the numbers change uh, depending on which institution give the numbers, but in general, it, it's uh, 11 million houses that, it, that are needed. And we face uh, the, the problem after producing so many houses in the peripheries of the cities that we came up with the expansion of cities. There were the main cities expanding like seven times of the sizes. Um, housing developments are disconnected, distant, and dispersed. Uh, they are not connected by transportation or any other um, way. There are lack of services and amenities, uh, institutions, government services. Um, so they, as we can see in, I don't know if we have a laser, yeah. Like, w people of course came up with solutions, uh, informal solutions for their needs. Also, uh, we faced abandonment housing, abandonment development, which came up with also insecurity and other forms of um, safety issues and health issues too. And the one of the, the conditions that we face now is that we not just have abandoned houses, but also we have invasion in this abandoned housing. So now we have informality within formality also. And well, that, that's how we, we, we were invited to work at, at Infonavit and this is where we were facing. So we were trying to understand the phenomenon and what, what was happening and how we can came up with strategies, uh, projects and research in order to get some uh, ways, I, I wouldn't call solutions, but ways to towards um, finding a better way of producing housing and also a better way of uh, solving the existing conditions. Um, one, one thing in, in, in the last panel um, mentioned innovation, like there is not only innovation what is needed, but I think it's, it's innovation what is needed. It's innovation in design, innovation in technology, innovation in policy making, innovation in every sense in order to solve these issues that is not just uh, happening in Mexico, but in Latin America and in the global south, and of course in many of the uh, poorest communities in the states. And we found that one that is one thing that is really important is to include the community, the end user, in the process. Uh, we tend to forget um, if we are architects or if we are policy makers or if we are um, developers, tend to forget for who we are uh, building these uh, homes. And I, I think that we need to be more creative in finding ways to build flexible housing uh, flexible typologies and um, flexible conditions for financing also these homes and uh, including also one important thing is including experts in the process in Mexico we left out architects um, since the 70s in the social issues at the end of the last century and the beginning of this one were developers who were in charge of uh, constructing the, the models or the typologies that were used and architects were working very little in that process. And I, I think also that, um, well, we introduced some strategies of um, working with the community through art and other uh, kind of cultural uh, workshops that could get an opening in order for the community to 
began working together because that's something else that is happening that the, the, these communities are people who came from the cities, from the countryside, and they don't know each other, so there is not a sense of community. And through the through culture and other community efforts, we were able to understand better what are the 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 needs. So at at the end of the of my work there, I, I can say that some issues that are very important are, of course, working with the community during the whole process, um, being a specific in the site. With the, that, that's something that come up in the panels, like how do you design specifically for that community and for that uh, place? The, taking care of the quality of the construction and the design is a very important thing. And trying to find a way of customize, even though you can do prefab like in this project. We were more uh, specific in terms, well, I'm showing some images of the public space because also we stretch, one of the things that we were trying to do was stretching the concept of housing, particularly because it's affordable housing, and the units, the minimum size in Mexico City is around 400 square feet, which is for a family of five or six or seven or whoever uh, is going to inhabit that, that home. And the price, just to give a, a sense of how much is the, the price in this, in Mexico is around $1,800, um, $18,000 per home. Um, so we were stretching the idea of home, affordable housing, including the public space. Uh, if you live in a city and you live in a small apartment, you have the, the amenities that you can work in the coffee shop in front of your home, you can go to a community place. But in these cases where there is only homes, there is no way that the, these people can uh, get together or get have other um, other activities rather than this tiny place. So we were uh, trying to build specific public spaces for the specific needs in different places in the throughout Mexico. And I I would say thank you that I think that architects can be um, an orchestrator of all this process. I think that we need to work in an integral process since the beginning with the community. And we need to work with developers, and we are the ones, uh, at least I found that because of the, the capacity that we develop through our education of solving different uh, problems and managing the all these different uh, elements that we have to put together in order to to get a project done that we can bring together we can bring to the table developers financing people uh, the policy making people the government and NGOs and trying to create a, a more integral process because I think that one of the problems that we had is that People in policy making are trying to do some work, but without thinking on the community specifically, like in, in, in a really site specific uh, way. Uh, architects are focusing more on the design, but without thinking on, on the policies and also on the, on the financing side. And developers are working on producing massively and, and more, uh, they care more about uh, understandable, but they care more about the, the, the finance part. Um, and by doing this, we, we create a very community and a community that could push also for a better uh, legislation and a better uh, engagement with the government also. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to have Terry and Mark join us up here on the podium now uh, with, uh, for a couple more questions, and then we'll head to the reception. So today is getting mic'd up. So let me um, first introduce uh, Mark. Mark Norman was a, a 2015 Loeb Fellow, part of the Loeb contingent here today. 
Uh, he's a founding, uh, founder of the consulting firm Ideas in Action and an associate professor of practice at the University of Michigan Taubman School of Architecture and Urban Planning. It's great to have you here with us, Mark. Mark was uh, engaged with the Joint Center back when he was a Lobe, <clears throat> and uh, it's great to have you back here today. Um, Mark was also the curator of an exhibition called Designing Affordability that looked beyond the U.S. borders to examine lessons from around the world. So Mark, uh, you also recently wrote a piece about the potential to expand industrialized housing production in Australia. So are, are there approaches you've seen elsewhere that we haven't discussed today, things that we ought to be considering, or other lessons for us? Um, well, one thing I really like about this conference is it encompasses design, policy, and finance. Uh, I'm also surprised that uh, you and me, Chris, are the only academics at the GSD, which is, <laughs> and I can't believe I'm calling myself an academic. Um, but I've really gone more into writing um, and thinking about things and talking to practitioners uh, more than developing lately. So what you see behind me are um, recent publications that I have articles in. And I think to your question, the um, industrialized house building uh, what they call it in Australia, was actually came out of a conference, an international conference, asking the same questions we talked about here. Um, so it was um, modular uh, home builders and contractors wondering why their products weren't part of the market, why we still do things from 100 years ago. Um, and I don't have the answer to that, but what I tried to um, think about in the article was, one, 95% um, of uh, the environment is already built. So we're talking about a very, we're talking about a lot of units per year around the world, but a very small percentage. Um, so one of the things I think about and I've talked to them about was um, how can modular infuse itself into um, renovation and expansion, which also creates additional affordability. Um, the other thing I, um, focused on, and I think Terry will talk about this a lot, um, is the notion that um, in the US at least, our cities are sort of laboratories for affordability. Everybody's doing all sorts of different things as we've heard today, um, but they're also laboratories for exclusion um, in many ways, um, like Adi talked about. And so um, I um, also put up what I'm reading. <laughs> Um, because um, we have a sort of fundamental problem of exclusionary zoning and redlining um, that underlies many of the problems we are talking about here today. Um, so when we talk about what we can't build and why we can't build it and why we have to think about parking, it goes back to issues that are pretty intractable that uh, we need some theorists and social scientists for as well. And so what I like about these uh, particular books is that people are using big data um, and precedent to look at the ways um, that we got into our existing problems and maybe ways we can find our ways um, out of it. Um, and then um, finally, uh, I would just say for the industrial house builders or the modular people, um, one of the things that uh, organizations like LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation and Enterprise did uh, as lenders and investors, they actually embedded themselves um, not just in building but into an affordable housing ecosystem, meaning lobbying and changing the qualified allocation plans to assert greater affordability, um, locational specificity in terms of transportation, um, and um, certain standards. So I think with, with um, modular construction, the way we talk about how it reduces cost or reduces time is something that should be embedded in the affordable housing network and in the way we fund projects. Um, you know, so that's one way, I think, um, a very small niche of a niche of new construction, but a way that I think it could really show its worth and get us more units. Yeah. And then finally, that's what I'm listening to. <laughs> <laughs> we got a playlist. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I think uh, your, your, your point in particular about the fact that, you know, the vast majority of housing we have exists, right? And we're, we're talking today about adding on the margin. Mm -hmm. And it, adding on the margin is important because it does create what the, the kind of cost of housing is. And so if, if the substitute housing you get from a new housing unit is too high, it raises the cost of existing housing as well. But we do have to think about solutions that deal with the existing stock. And I think James Shen work in particular in this regard of thinking about the kind of mass production techniques that kind of retrofit within is an example, I think,
think of how we have to think within that stock, and also the ADUs. We haven't talked a lot about ADUs today. I'm glad you brought that up as a little teaser. But how do we then make use of the existing built environment and fit units in in a way that creates greater density? And to Kent Colton, who was talking about the fact that we have a lot of single family housing, and that's that kind of level of density is here to stay, and, but, but maybe we can make it just a little more dense and a little more affordability with things like ADUs and the like as well. So I think that's a, that's a great uh, point. Terry, I, I need to get you in here, this, this conversation as well. Terry Ludwig is president and CEO of Enterprise Community Partners. Um, a very, I count you as a very good friend of the Joint Center. I, I think we probably invite you to too many panels, but you always say yes, <laughs> and so we invite you back. Um, you know, an enterprise community partners has been at the forefront of a lot of innovative thinking about housing, about, about housing finance, about housing policy, about housing design with Katie Swenson taking the lead on much of that, who's we already have uh, claimed as a good friend, and, and other areas as well. You know, and one of the things we've touched upon today is how new technologies can bring greater efficiencies in the construction process. But, you know, we're talking, getting ready for this panel, you were talking about the fact that there's a host of, host of other ways in which technology and big data can be brought to bear to disrupt the housing market. A lot of the, the sidebar conversations I've been having, that word disruption keeps coming up about how do we disrupt the housing market. And so I, uh, I put the question to you, what are some of the other ways that technology and data might be employed to disrupt housing to help bring down the cost? Mm, thanks, Chris. Yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be here and um, with friends here on the panel as well. And um, as you know, Mark just said, oh, we, we do take an ecosystem approach at Enterprise, and maybe I would just say a little bit of context on that is that, you know, we're delivering capital right now at a fairly healthy scale at about $8 billion a year. Um, we are doing local solutions on the ground, which are, are indeed our innovation labs that we're learning from, and then really trying to take the policy pieces and say, based off what's working or not working, how do we get that into more of a systems change lens? Because we think it's really important for the scale and it's been pretty confronting. And I think we've just been talking about this all day today, is that the, although we've touched millions of lives, we're not getting to those population level outcomes that we want. So we've been really challenging ourselves to say, how do we use this platform? How do we use our ecosystem? And really try to innovate with that, because we are mission central, right? And folks in here, I thought what was so encouraging today is you just hear people are really passionate about the mission. But how do we make sure mission meets scale? and that we are putting the people at the center of that change. So at Enterprise, we've been really thinking about how do we challenge ourselves, and, and one of the ways, and I think we got a lot of taste of that today, so I won't reiterate that, but I do think that innovation, uh, particularly using technology and big data, I just think it's a whole new avenue um, where we can make um, not just incremental changes, but ones that I think can really make a meaningful dent in those that are not only don't have a home or don't have an affordable home, but also drive those connections to opportunity. I think Sorella just did an amazing visual about it's not just about the housing. It is about those connections to opportunity. So we have to remain, our focus has to remain on mission and people. So um, at Enterprise, what we're trying to do is kind of put our, 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 our eye on some of these trends and think about how do we change and actually be willing to disrupt our own business, be willing to disrupt our own systems in a, in a huge way for the good of the mission. And when I kind of think back at this, I guess maybe just putting ourselves a little bit in a headspace of just within five to seven years, I was just looking at these statistics, which I have here from the World Economic Forum. So out in 2025, what the world might look like, imagine we would have one trillion sensors connected to the internet. Scary, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like sensors. Uh, but you know, there's companies today that are obviously there big crane companies that are using sensors from above, looking at construction sites, trying to maximize supply chain, uh, the amount of data that that's collecting, big data, that will allow us to be more predictive in some of our behaviors, it's amazing. Um, over 50% of the total internet traffic will be regarding, it'll be about smart homes. It'll be homes and what you're driving with appliances and devices. So how do we make sure low-income families and inclusive strategies are going to benefit from that? So those are things, I mean, if we think about, um, there was a lot of discussion on transportation today, a little bit on autonomous vehicles. But if you think about um, that, that's just huge. Driverless cars will be 10% of all the cars on the roads. So we talked a lot about the expense of parking, right? And what does that mean, right? If you have 
15 to 30% of the urban land is parking and you have say a 50% reduction in that. What does that mean in terms of land utilization, policy, um, and revaluation that's gonna occur? So when we start to think about this, and it's, it's just huge. Um, yeah, we talked about a 3D printed house, right? And that's alive and well right now. It's starting to catch traction. In 2025, there'll be a 3D printed car, right? So how we're thinking, um, I was really glad how we're thinking about the connection between housing and transportation for us is particularly important because the families we serve, those are their two biggest you know, pocketbook issues. So we're just really trying to think about what are those kinds of companies that we can invest in that will disrupt? How do we use some of these technologies? Um, and then I think the other technology that wasn't mentioned at all today, but I do think that you know, when we're talking about the, the financing systems, I also think just the, uh, some of you are very familiar, I'm sure, with blockchain, but it's you know, a whole new way of disintermediate. We, we were talking about disintermediating the supply chain. The financing chains are also getting uh, you know, shrunk and getting disintermediated through things like blockchain. And you know, in 2025, it's projected that 10% of the GDP, the activity around GDP, will be stored on blockchain technology. That's certainly nothing we're talking about today. So at Enterprise, what we're starting to think about is what are, the, what are the implications for low-income families that are renters and the people that are having to move around and don't have a credit history as a result? How do we think about, could blockchain be an answer to having a more transparent and portable kind of uh, credit score? Is there an alternative that we could attach a lending policy to and actually create different mortgage products? So, just that's just a glimpse of you know sort of looking at trends and then on the big data side I guess I would just say too that we've curated a platform which I'd love to share if you want to check it out on the web but it's Opportunity 360 and it's say, it's intentionally creating a you know a, an opportunity platform a data big data platform that puts housing at the center mm -hmm. of both the outcomes we want for people and for communities and saying, let's put that at the center and then drive those important connections to other op opportunity elements like economic security and mobility and infrastructure and, and health and education. And how do we look at that in total? So if we're looking in place at people's outcomes or we know how important place is, um, how, do we, how do we look at that in, together and drive hopefully some predictive analytics that give us you know, urban like snapshots going forward to use that big data in a way so we're, we're a little bit not just behind the game, but we're ahead of the game. So those are some things we're thinking about actively right now. That's terrific. You know, um, as I said at, at the outset that we framed today, there's a lot of things that we didn't put on the table that we should have. And you've, you know, I think you've listed a lot of them. So there's a lot of fodder for a, another event here. I know we're almost at the end. We did have one last question I think we're going to put up, uh, which was to, uh, to poll the audience. Now that we've spent this day digging into these issues, um, whether or not your, how your attitudes have, have evolved in terms of where the most promise is going forward in trying to address these issues. Um, and so the, you can pick uh, new approaches to design, new ways of building housing units, changes in regulation and governments, other or <laughs> none of the above. Uh, we kind of forced you not to be able to say all of the above because that's the obvious answer. But I think um, you know, after the first panel, I think Katie said that, uh, that came away with that, a lot of optimism about the kind of innovations and creativity that the folks who were talking about on the design side. Uh, the, the second panel, I came away with the same. The regulatory panel gets a little depressing, I think, because there's <laughs> it's, uh, no, not your fault, Shakar, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's a harder nut to crack. I and mean, I think uh, folks like Jesse on the panel and the kind of energy that people are bringing to the IMBI movement um, is an important one. At my table, we were talking about where we'd vote on that, and James said, Chen said, nothing happens without YIMBY. Yeah. And so in some sense, you know, that, that, that should have been the vote. But so I think, given our last few moments here, um, I'll just put you to the kind of a lightning round very quickly for each of our panelists, both on the conversation base we had today and your own experience. What do you think is the issue, the piece of this that holds the most promise in the short term? We'll start with you, Sodeo. For me, is uh, is uh, as I was trying to, to say, is a, um, a way to bring everybody together and try to innovate in each of the areas, but in an integral process. Right. And don't forget about the community because the community, the end user, I mean, the people is, they are experts in how they use the space. Right. So also like 
they can bring, and James mentioned a little bit of that, like they can bring information, important information to the process, not right. just the design, but also the, the legal and economical process. And, right. I, and I think that we, as professionals, need to be more flexible and more creative in the work that we do. Fabulous. Mark? Um, well, I think we need to be more creative, but also when you look at, well, so one thing I've learned from looking internationally is everybody has a housing crisis um, mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, but I think one thing, um, when it's not as bad as here or it seems like they're addressing it, it's top down, meaning national policy, minimum standards, minimum regulations. Mm -hmm. Um, so I actually think we might see more what maybe some countries might call rational, like coordinated policy and what in California we call preemption um, will be maybe more the norm because some of these um, legacies are so intractable. Mm -hmm. Terry. I'm going to give a shout out to Shekar. I'm looking at him, I'm like, it's a state of emergency. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's, I think, Maybe how could we, I would take away, say, how could we make this much more urgent? And, you know, is it the state of emergency that allows us to build the will? Because I think without the will to do this, um, we, you know, we can do this. We heard, the, we heard the solutions. You know, we could do this. We have enough entrepreneurial spirit. We have enough money. We have enough, you know, outcomes that we know what this costs and how it affects kids' health and education. We know that this is the right thing to do and it's the economic thing to do. It's building the will. So... So if we, just, if we know all that, why can't we build the will? I mean, that's the, that is the question I know that we all ask ourselves every day. But do you have any? Yeah, I, I think uh, we're doing a lot of things to try to motivate that. And I, I don't know. I, I think that's the question of the hour is how do we build the will? And we're doing a lot of things all together and partners. I see a lot of familiar faces to try to do that. But I think it's the storytelling. I think it's the you know, creating a common, it's an us, not a them. It's not othering. We're not othering. This is right. us. This is our American dream. Right. Let's be up to it. Now, I know Enterprise has done a lot of work on that, too, on how to, yeah, how to change the narrative. I'm looking up at the screen and seeing, you know, I, I, I frame this to say in the near term, <laughs> trying to get people not, because I think coming into this, I think the answer was going to be regulation is the, is the way we, the place we have to work. And I was trying to say, well, in the near term, what would you think? But we're still getting regulation as the place we have to work. <laughs> Um, I, I think that's uh, it's sobering for me. I, I do think I took away from this. I think, in some sense, there's there's a lot of really interesting work on the design side, and so you know, I, I think it, and Andrew and and, um, and Michael um, and uh, who was the other panelists? Uh, Brian. Brian. Uh, Brian. I mean, you guys. You. I mean, there's great ideas, and so it's a question of how do we how do we you know socialize these more. Uh, on the construction side, you know, I think we've seen some really innovative ideas. I come away with thinking that this is going to create some disruption. So I think you know, Frank's point you know, that we have a system that is, um, you know, we are preaching to the choir here. Yeah. And so that, what you're saying is how do we convince those other folks? And I think what we're counting on is that there's going to be some disruption from outside that's going to shake things up. And I do think that on the design side and the construction side, I would have voted more up there because I think I'm, I'm less, I'm unlike Frank, I'm a cynic when it comes to how we're going to move the needle on the regulatory side. But I think we can disrupt it with new, new constructions and new designs um, and use those kind of market forces to help to, to get more density, to get more affordable housing. Um, but I, I think we have to listen to the poll and say, <laughs> we all have to leave here with a mandate to change the narrative and to work because it is a, a social emergency. Um, I want to thank you all for being here for being part of this conversation. It's something that the Joint Center is going to keep working on. I hope you've made some new connections today, and I hope you come and have a beer and a glass of wine and see the student work with us now. So thank you all for all thank your you. participation.